I know, you've read the title. So why compare the Netflix adaptation of One Piece to the Witcher adaptation? At first glance, both of these franchises don't have anything in common with one another, both tone and style. One is an over-the-top cartoony pirate adventure show, and the other is a more grounded medieval dark fantasy. But what they actually have in common is their resource pool. They both got a big budget, they're both on Netflix, and they're both based off of record-setting source material. Ichira Oda's One Piece manga as of 2022 has over half a billion dollars in sales and somehow outsells the entirety of the Western comic book industry put together. Andrei Sapowski's Witcher books have sold over 33 million copies. And if that isn't impressive for you, the content of those books was so good that the CD Projekt Red games based off of them have sold over 75 million copies, making it one of the best selling video game franchises in existence. The Witcher adaptation had every reason to succeed, while One Piece was set up for failure. But somehow, some way, the exact opposite ended up happening. The Witcher show ended up imploding in on itself, and the One Piece live action ended up setting records for 2023. And this is against conventional wisdom. Anime adaptations have a record for sucking, and sorted sorcery fantasy shows are generally speaking a slam dunk because we in the West have good experience with this type of thing. From Conan the Barbarian, to Lord of the Rings, to the first few seasons of Game of Thrones, generally we know how to do fantasy properly. But the real reason why I decide to compare these two series is that the key difference in how these adaptations succeeded or failed is based solely off of one factor. Do the creators actually respect the source material? This one factor alone can make or break a production. The Witcher had a great first season, but as the writers and directors strayed from the source material, it ended up imploding in on itself, losing its lead cast member, Henry Cavill. The live action One Piece, on the other hand, was made from the ground up to respect the source material, down to the fact that Oda himself had to approve of everything going on in the show. This is a story about how through sheer hubris, the creators of The Witcher show fumbled a golden ticket to easy fame and success, and how the One Piece showrunners through sheer determination got victory from the jaws of defeat. All right, before I continue, I just want to get this quick little disclaimer out of the way. I'm a filthy casual when it comes to both The Witcher and One Piece. For One Piece, I've read up until the start of the Water 7 arc, and as for The Witcher, I've played the entirety of the first game, and I've just started the third one recently. While I am a big casual for both of these series, I would consider this a bit of an advantage for specifically criticizing both of them as an adaptation. I know enough about both series to know the core essence of what they're about, but I'm also not overly attached enough to not give the adaptations a decent shot on their own merits. The overall theme of this video is about how the One Piece showrunners were able to use the source material in a way that they were able to create diamonds out of coal, while the Witcher showrunners neglected this source material so much that they turned a gold statue into a turd. But before I get into how or why, I gotta get the shameless self-promotion out of the way. Please like, comment, and subscribe to The Gaming Grappler. The more this channel grows, the more time, effort, and dedication I could bring into delivering you guys content on a consistent and regular basis. I'm pretty sure we've all heard this expression before. If you cut off the head, the body will die. And in terms of running a television show, the head in this case is the writing. Because it doesn't matter how good your directing is or your casting or cinematography, if you have a terrible script, then nothing will save your show. And it's no secret that the show writers for the Netflix Witcher adaptation did not like the source material, which is insane to me because the writing is already done for you. Bo DeMaio, a former writer and producer of the Witcher Netflix show, has been on record saying that the rest of the staff actively disliked Andrzej Sapowski's books in the CD Projekt Red games. And here's a quote for him while he was talking about another upcoming project, X-Men 97, and here's what he had to say. My general rule was you had to be a fan, no questions. I've been on a show, namely The Witcher, where some of the writers were not or actively disliked the books and games, even actively mocking the source material. It's a recipe for disaster and bad morale. Fandom as a litmus test checks egos and makes all the long nights worth it. You have to respect the work before you're allowed to add to its legacy. 
If you guys are more interested to find out everything wrong that happened with the Witcher Netflix adaptation, there's a great video by Kira TV cataloging everything I just mentioned behind the scenes in terms of the writing room and also Henry Cavill's inevitable departure from the show. But some new information has recently come out where Andrei Sapowski, while being interviewed by a YouTuber called Serial Killers, has been on record saying that he actually gave the Netflix execs a lot of notes on how to run the show, but he was actively ignored and disregarded. And I'll let you hear from the man in his own words. But no, uh, maybe I gave them some ideas, but they never listened to me. <laughs> they never listened to me. <laughs> but it's normal. It's normal. Who's this? This writer. There's nobody. <laughs> This mindset from the Witcher staff of actively disregarding Andrei Sapowski from the creative process doesn't make any logical sense to me. Like, let's just imagine for argument's sake that you're a soulless corporal working at Netflix and your job, like any soulless corporal out there, is to make as much money as humanly possible. Imagine this Polish writer walks into your office whose books have sold over 33 million copies. And the games based off of those books have sold an additional 75 million copies. Imagine looking at that man whose ideas are worth money and pure gold and kicking him out of your office and then going, Duh, I don't need your help. I'm just going to use these college dropouts. That's basically what happened. And the show ended up committing suicide. One of the reasons why I was so motivated to make this video is because we have a clear cut example how having a negative attitude towards the original creators and source material can have a complete negative cascading effect on the rest of the production. And the creators behind the One Piece show and the creators behind the Witcher show had complete opposite opinions on how to handle the source material. Whereas the team that brought us the live action Witcher show viewed Andre Sapowski as a complete nuisance to be avoided at all costs, the team that brought us the One Piece adaptation viewed Ichira Oda as an essential asset. Ichira Oda was given full creative control over the entirety of the production process. Every decision through casting to what scenes needed to be reshooted had to first be filtered through Oda. From the top down, producers like Matt Owens weren't your typical Hollywood suit. Matt is a super fan who knows the source material, who knows One Piece off of the back of his hand. And that's not just my opinion. Oda himself has personally vouched for the guy. He understands One Piece more than anyone else. We did go through an earlier phase when we went through some trials and tribulations because there's no roadmap for a successful adaptation. For a while, we struggled to figure out how to go about creating a live action One Piece for a global audience. But one day, a few years in, I received scripts that showed that he and his team really captured the characters, which brought me great joy. And in another separate interview, he said, the producers and the crew are pros at live action. And frankly, they're One Piece super fans too. The more knowledgeable you are about One Piece, the more you're likely to notice the love they poured into this. And wouldn't you know it, this creative collaboration between the One Piece showrunners and Ichira Oda himself ended up a genius move because whether you like it or not, like me personally, I wasn't a big fan of One Piece's art style. It took a while before it grew on me. But one thing you really can't take away from Oda is that the man has one of the best work ethics in the entire industry. I don't know if you know this, but creating manga on a weekly basis could be one of the most physically taxing things you could do to your body. Some of my favorite manga authors out there have died in this process. And while that kind of bums me out, I just want to point out that Oda has been doing this for almost 30 years. And supposedly during this process, he also found time to help work on the One Piece adaptation. So this man is a machine when it comes to work ethics. Having Oda be a part of the creative process ended up paying off big time. One Piece worldwide was one of the most popular shows in 2023. It turns out the man behind Planet Earth's most popular graphic novel knew how to create a hit when given the opportunity. Who would have thought, right? But as we continue on this video, we're going to find out that common sense isn't common at all. Not all works of fiction translate well into live action equally, especially in the fantasy genre. Some things work better than others. And I really want to put up a spotlight of just how perfectly groomed for success The Witcher was. Now, to be fair, the first season of the show was actually pretty good, but as I've already mentioned earlier, the writers began to deviate from the source material 
and they couldn't keep that momentum going in the following seasons. And that's a damn shame because the Netflix Witcher adaptation should have been impossible to screw up. It had a decent budget and the source material was perfect for TV. I gotta let you in on a secret. The Witcher is a medieval dark fantasy and that's something we in the West are well experienced in bringing to live action. With movies like Conan the Barbarian, Lord of the Rings, and the first few seasons of Game of Thrones, we kind of have a decent blueprint of how to pull off sordid sorcery in live action, and we've been doing it for almost 40 years now. We already have an established industry of special effects artists and cinematographers who already know how to bring orcs and elves to live action. This is old news to us. The Witcher also had the unfair advantage of having three fantastic video games in a popular book series to pull inspiration from. Just imagine for a second how streamlined the production process could have been. Like, let's just say for argument's sake that you wanted to bring one of the monster designs from the games to live action. All you would have to do is literally drag and drop a photorealistic 3D model of one of those monster designs from the game's files and then cross-reference it with something you've seen on TV. I'm not saying that this would be easy, but it's not like these guys had to start from nothing. The showrunners of The Witcher were handed a golden ticket, and they proceeded to wipe their ass with it. Comparatively speaking, Tomorrow Studios was given the Herculean task of translating One Piece into live action. And One Piece is based on an anime and manga for Japan. And even the Japanese struggled to bring manga to the big screen. While they have the cultural understanding, they never had the budget or the resources to pull it off properly. While we in the West have all the money in the world, we lack the cultural understanding or the experience to bring manga to live action. As if that wasn't challenging enough, One Piece's setting and character designs couldn't be more difficult to bring to live action. It's a pirate manga with one of the biggest worlds in all of fiction. The scope of the One Piece world is deliberately nonsensical and unapologetically over the top. Luffy and his crew for one arc could venture into a more typical desert-themed island only for them in the next arc to sail in the sky and fight a race of cloud people with little cupid wings. Some arcs have the crew go to an island made up of sugar treats, kind of like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. The point is, anything goes in One Piece, and while the East Blue arcs covered in the show are more reserved in comparison, Tomorrow Studios still went all out here. Most of the sets were physically made. The Going Merry isn't a CG representation of a ship, it's an actual ship that was physically made and filmed in. Even at a base level, there are a lot of little quirks to the world of One Piece that the showrunners had to get right. Even though this world has electricity, news is still delivered by cute little birds with hats on, and sound is channeled through psychic snails that look like they came out of SpongeBob. These little things add up to a logistical nightmare, with the team finding the right balance of both CGI and practical effects respectively. And like most manga, the character designs are over the top, with crazy clothes and unrealistic hair colors. The makeup and prosthetic team had quite the challenge to pull off these character designs and have it not look like a low-budget cosplay. And I just want to point out how hard this must have been for the directors and show writers to get right. They don't have a catalog of movies to look at. We don't exactly have much reference material of animatronic talking snails here. The fact that the team behind Tomorrow Studios was able to make One Piece look so good in real life is a testament to the power of respecting the source material, truly creating diamonds out of coal. Again, I'm not trying to imply that the practical and special effects of the Witcher television show were bad. As a matter of fact, I actually kind of liked them. But what I am trying to say though is that if the writers didn't deliberately self-sabotage the project, it would have been smooth sailing from the production end of things and we could have had the entire book series adapted faithfully. And we missed out on that because the creators deliberately ignored the source material. When it comes to main characters, it feels like Geralt of Rivia was deliberately created to appeal to Western audiences. The guy is a swashbuckling mercenary badass who has his own moral code. It also helps that, you know, in English, he has that same kind of iconic Clint Eastwood voice, but Geralt was also debatably based off of Michael Moorcock's Elric of Melibene. And Elric is a brooding white-haired albino mercenary type who fights with an evil demonic sword. Now, I'm not claiming that Geralt is a ripoff, and you'll find endless debate about this very subject matter on YouTube, but that's not the point of this video. The point is, is that 
Moorcock's Elric archetype is extremely popular and influential in both the East and the West. If you like characters like Dante from Devil May Cry, Alucard from Castlevania, or even the Targaryens from Game of Thrones, they owe a lot of their inspiration to Moorcock's creations. In House of the Dragon, Daemon Targaryen just flat out wears an Elric armor set at one point, and it looks like he was ripped right off of the pages from the books. Geralt's personality also lends itself a little better to mass appeal. He's a quick-witted and cynical monster slayer, and he's a little more easygoing compared to brooding and dark characters like Elric. There is a reason why Witcher 3 is one of the best-selling video games of all time. This character is popular and has already proven itself amongst many different types of media. It also helps that Henry Cavill is one of the best leads you could possibly ask for. This was a man who actually respected the source material. He read all the books and he beat The Witcher 3 on multiple separate occasions, which is surprising because that game is gigantic. Henry got so into the role that he managed to perfectly mimic Doug Cockle's voice from the game while portraying Geralt in live action. And I haven't seen that level of dedication since Ryan Reynolds perfectly replicated Nolan North's Deadpool voice while portraying Deadpool for real in live action. Geralt was perfectly cast. If you ask an AI, if you ask Skynet to generate an image of what Geralt would look like in real life, it'll just generate images of Henry Cavill's face. That's just how perfectly cast he was for the role. For the longest time, Henry Cavill carried the Witcher on his back, but as the series continued, and as he began to notice that it deviated too much from the source material, he lost his motivation to continue playing the character and decided it was best to walk off the show. This is just how out of line the writers for The Witcher were. They lost their best talent that you could possibly ask for. Tomorrow Studios weren't so lucky with the material they had to work with. Monkey D. Luffy couldn't be a more difficult presence to bring to live action if you tried. He's a loud, hyperactive, positive character who can at times shout his ambitions at the top of his lungs. He's very positive in a world where every protagonist is a cynical tryhard. And when pressed about this, here's what Oda had to say. But one of my personal philosophies is to not depict a world that is too bleak. Making someone like Luffy the hero allows me to take even the most serious of situations and make it fun somehow. Oda himself has even said in interviews that finding an actor to play Luffy would be the hardest part. Really, my biggest worry about the live action was whether we would be able to find someone like Luffy. So I watched a lot of videos of various auditions, and when I found Inaki, I kind of laughed a bit. There's this really touching moment where Oda himself, at his secret underground lair, congratulates Inaki Godoy on getting the role. And somehow, Inaki did the impossible and managed to bring Luffy to the big screen. For me, it personally took a few episodes before Luffy's personality clicked with me, but I'm amazed at what they were able to do. Luffy comes off as somebody who is confident and friendly, which is a nice change of pace from your typical brooding and depressing character like Batman. Luffy's superpowers are also notoriously challenging to get right in live action. Just look at characters like Mr. Fantastic, who end up looking like some sort of Lovecraft abomination. And while it can look a little dicey sometimes, it really grew on me. It suits Luffy's friendly personality, and his fighting style is cool to see in live action, like seeing Luffy take advantage of spacing and try to keep his enemies as far away from him as possible while fighting aggressively. I would also like to point out that the entire cast for the Straw Hat Pirates weren't just any group of actors, they were One Piece super fans to the degree that they will argue and bicker amongst themselves about who has the best character, and people like McKenyu will take it personally if you question their knowledge about One Piece. Anime, yeah, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. So can you start? Well, what anime do you like? Give me that mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let him start. Who are you asking? I'm Japanese. Uh, I know. Am I a fan of anime? I grew <laughs> up with anime. Yeah, I have it honestly feels like the entire main cast of One Piece had the same level of dedication that Henry Cavill had for portraying Geralt, with some notable examples being Taz Schuyler, who portrayed Sanji, and Mikenyo Arata, who played Zoro. Taz Schuyler not only had to learn how to cook as well as Sanji, he also had to learn how to kick as well as him. And then you have Mikenyu, who's a veteran to the industry, who was honored to bring his expertise from working on action films and other anime adaptations from Japan to bring him to the West. 
The chemistry that the actors have while portraying the Straw Hat Pirates feels so real because they all legitimately love One Piece. They have a deep understanding of how these characters are supposed to interact with one another, and it elevates the show as a result. I feel like this video is just one gigantic case study about how important it is from a top-down level to have a genuine care and passion for the projects that you're working on. The One Piece live action adaptation was not supposed to succeed. It had the entire deck of cards stacked against it, but somehow, some way, the creators of the show were able to flip that around and make the hit success of 2023. And that's because at a top-down level, producers like Matt Owens genuinely love One Piece. And he was smart enough to know he had to work with Oda himself to make sure his show was as authentic to the manga as humanly possible. That authenticity is infectious from the actors all genuinely loving One Piece and understanding how their characters are supposed to interact with one another to the set designers wanting to build this world and make it look as close to the manga as possible. It just elevated the project in its entirety. The exact opposite scenario happened with The Witcher, and The Witcher had the entire deck of cards stacked in their favor. It's a property that just naturally translates better into live action, but the key difference here is that the only person that seemed to have a genuine care and passion for the project was Henry Cavill, who brought his A-game and portrayed Geralt of Rivia as good as humanly possible, but at a top-down level, the producers and showrunners of The Witcher didn't care about the project. The writers didn't want anything to do with Andrei Sapowski because they were only interested in using The Witcher as a vehicle to tell their own personal types of stories. And as a result, Henry Cavill got frustrated with the project and walked away from it along with the rest of the fans. <laughs> 